For today's video we're taking a look at a Shinon 200mm f3.5 M42 screw fit camera lens made in Japan in the 1970s. We've previously featured a Princeflex 135mm lens on the channel, which was actually a rebadged Shinon lens. I'll put a link to that video on screen about now. A couple of people had asked if the 200mm lens came apart in the same way as the 135 So as this lens needs a few things fixed, we may as well take a look. I started filming this video several months ago, and then the project just got put on one side, until now. The lens has an integral lens hood, and a large, very smooth focusing ring. There's an auto manual switch for the aperture, and it has apertures ranging from f3.5 to f22. And it has a minimum focusing distance which is marked as just under 9 foot. As I mentioned earlier, there are a few problems with this lens. It's obviously been dropped at some time, leaving this dent in the lens hood that catches on the lens cap that I'm using. That damage continues onto the filter thread, so I need to straighten that before I can attach filters. You might not be able to see on camera, but the front element is filthy. And if we look from the rear, you can hopefully see all the other debris inside the lens, so the optics will need to be cleaned. So the first job we'll tackle is the damaged filter thread. I'll use the lens vise for this. It should simply be a case of positioning the vise in line with the dented section, and then gently and carefully opening the vise to expand the dented area back into position. You want to make sure that you don't go too far. It's better to do a little bit and then check it against an appropriate filter. Anyway, that 62mm step-up ring fits OK, so that's the first job done. I'll leave straightening the lens hood until the rest of the lens is apart. Next we'll remove the front bezel. If we slide the lens hood up, it should reveal three grub screws that prevent the bezel from unwanted unscrewing. So I'll just remove these and put them safely in a tray. On some lenses you'll need to remove the front name ring, but this one is stuck in place with some lacquer, so I'll leave it be. With the grub screws out, I can grip the bezel behind the lens hood and unscrew it by hand. And now that's off, we can get to the lock ring that holds the front element in place. I can already see that the lock ring has had some lacquer applied to stop it coming loose. That could make this job tricky, but we'll see how we get on. Gripping these lock rings that don't have drive holes can be difficult. Often I have to make a collet spanner like this. I doubt that's actually the correct name for it, but it'll do for now. And obviously this one is too small for this lens. So I'll give it a try just gripping it with my fingers to see if it'll move. And it's my lucky day, <laughs> that was way too easy. I'll just finish that with the lens standing on end, because I don't want the glass elements falling out at the moment. And off it comes. Next is to remove the first glass element. I like to use a suction device to do this. That way, if there are multiple elements, I know exactly which way round they were fitted. If you just tip them out into your hand, occasionally one can flip over as it comes out, and that can make things a bit tricky. This sucker I'm using is actually intended for positioning SMD electrical components, and it might not be big enough for this size of lens. Yeah, that's not working so well. And it's not just the size of the element, it's actually acting like a piston, so I'm fighting against a vacuum as well. Oh well, I'll have to revert to my less preferred method. It gently does it. We've got a little bit of movement. I think I can probably grip it now, and you know, come on. And one front element. Make sure that you make a note of the convex and concave sides of each element as you take them out, because it's not always obvious when you want to reinstall them. Next, there's a spacer ring. Again, make a note of which way round it's installed as you take the lens apart, because by the time you come to reassemble the lens, you'll probably have forgotten. And now to carefully tip out the next element, or elements. Unless you know otherwise, it's best to assume that there will be more than one. And there we have one large element, or to be more accurate, a bonded group. 
While we've got the lens apart, I'll just point out a problem that was present with both the 135mm Chinon lenses that I've worked on. The screws that attach the focusing ring to the focusing mechanism had come loose, making it difficult or impossible to focus. I'll check the ones on this lens, but there appears to be plenty of lacquer to stop them moving. And they feel fine. I'm calling this stuff lacquer, it might actually be shellac or something like that, so I'm using the term lacquer in the loosest possible way. So next to come out is the middle element, or elements. You can see it down there in front of the aperture blades. I'm not sure that my lens wrench will reach that far, so I might have to get a bit creative. And as expected, my lens wrench won't reach that far. The front bar is far too wide to fit inside the lens barrel. So I've made myself a short bar specially for the job. So I'll see if I can get to the lock ring from this angle. And the answer is no. Right, I've repositioned. Hopefully I'll be able to see what I'm doing from this angle. It's still tricky to get the wrench located with the lock ring. And like everything else on this lens, that lock ring wasn't as tight as expected. Anyway, I should now be able to remove the lens element using my suction device. And sorry about my hand in front of the camera there. And there we have one lock ring and glass element. I'll just check that there aren't any more middle elements lurking down there. And no, there's nothing in front of the aperture blades, so I can safely get on and clean the parts I've removed so far. For cleaning lenses, I usually use warm water and washing up liquid. Perhaps if a lens had a really bad case of fungus, I might need to use something stronger. But this method has worked well so far, and with this lens it's just dirt and general haze that needs to be removed. I've made sure my hands are free of dirt and grit before starting this process, and make sure all traces of washing up liquid are rinsed off the lens before dabbing, not rubbing, it dry with something like kitchen towel. After the lens element has been washed, I'll give it a final clean using distilled water on a new cotton bud, before finally buffing it dry with another new cotton bud. For a better demonstration of this cleaning process, head over to Theoria Apophysis. I'll put a link to that video in the description. Finally, before reassembling the front half of the lens, I'll clean all the interior surfaces of the barrel with neat IPA on a cotton bud. Probably not necessary on this lens, but if there is some lurking mould, the IPA should deal with it. Again, if the lens was seriously infested with mould, I might put a little more thought into this part of the process. I've now reassembled the front half of the lens, except for the front bezel and lens hood, which still needs some work doing. I'll start off cleaning some sticky residue off the outside. I've got some paraffin handy, so that's what I'm going to use. And now that's done, it's time to tackle the dent. I'm using an old drumstick to carefully tap the dent out. The drumstick is hard enough to shape the metal without scratching the paint, and I'll carry on until the hood is round again. Lastly, I've filed off the rough spots from the damaged area, and now I'll just colour in the bare metal with a permanent marker. This is a far from perfect method, but it'll make the damage much less obvious when viewed from a distance, and besides, it doesn't really matter that much, so long as it functions correctly. So now I can screw the front bezel back on and tighten it by hand, and then nip up the three grub screws to stop it unscrewing by accident. That just leaves us with the rear element to remove and clean. I've had a quick look at this already, and yet again the lock ring was surprisingly loose, allowing me to simply unscrew it using my fingers. And with that out of the way, I can reach in with my suction device and remove the single lens element for cleaning. Right, that's everything cleaned and back together, so all that's left to do is to test the lens. We'll start off with test shots at all apertures to see how well the lens performs. Wide open at f3.5, the image is fairly soft, and as you would expect, it gets softer still as you move out towards the corners. 
What surprised me was the amount of chromatic aberration. If we zoom into the centre of the image where there's higher contrast, it's very noticeable. Things sharpen up quite a bit by f4, although the chromatic aberration is still very evident. In fact, that doesn't really go away from the centre until about f11, and it never leaves the corners. Overall though, f4 gives a perfectly usable image. By f5.6 the image is pretty sharp all over, and although still there, the chromatic aberration in the centre isn't too bad by now. f8 is where the lens is at its sharpest, and if we take a look at the top right corner, it's more or less sharp out to the edge. You can still see the chromatic aberration on those screw heads. Easy enough to fix in image processing, if required of course. f11 is good just not quite as sharp as f8, and if we take a look at the centre, this is about as good as it gets in regards of unwanted colour fringing. By f16 the image is disappointingly soft, as you can see on this cropped image. Still, with a bit of careful sharpening it would still be usable. f22 is not good at all, however I have noticed that the aperture on this lens closes further than it should do, actually letting cracks of light in at the edges of the aperture blades, which will have a pretty bad effect on the image. I'm not even going to bother to try to fix that issue, because I'll never use the lens at f22, and yes, probably all the other apertures are wrong, but as I'm taking metre readings through the lens that doesn't really matter. This shot of some daffodils was taken with the lens wide open, and on a shot like this, the imperfections of the lens can actually add some character to the image. I spotted this group of corroded old pistons sitting on an old door. I quite liked the textures, so I snapped a shot or two at f5.6, enough to get a bit of sharpness in the subject and foreground, while leaving the background nicely out of focus. I took a couple of shots of some pampas grass, from a low angle, and with a fairly lifeless sky as the background. The first shot was wide open at f3.5, and the second was shot at f5.6. I wanted them to be almost in silhouette, but not quite. I definitely prefer the first shot with its softer look, and the colour fringing of the lens adds a little interest to the background. I wouldn't usually use a long lens like this to shoot an entire video sequence, but for the purpose of this video I have done, so as usual we'll crank up the music and let the video roll.
think that will probably do for this video. If you've enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe to the channel. And don't forget to click on the bell icon so you get notifications when a new video is released. And if you fancy supporting the channel to help create future videos, there's a PayPal link in the description. But that's totally voluntary. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in a future video.